Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be talking you through my Q3 favourites of 2021. So these are my 10 favourite books from uh, July, August and September of 2021. Dane reads. We'll go straight on into it. So at number 10 we have Volta by Nikki Dudley. So this is like a crime slash thriller novel. Um, it breaks the mould a little bit. It's got a little bit of those like psychological thriller edges to it. But um, it just had a lot more of a sense of humour as well. Um, as opposed to like, you know, your Gone Girls and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and Nikki is, I suppose, an indie writer. I mean, she's published by a small press and actually it won an award as well. Um, she used to go to my university and she is one of the co-editors and co founders of Street Cave magazine. I actually have a quote from her on uh, the front of my poetry collection as well. Um, I was asked to review this as part of the blog tour. It was being organised by Isabel Kenyon of Fly on the Wall Poetry Press, who I've worked with in the past. And because I knew Nikki, I was like, no, don't worry, don't send me a copy. I'll buy one. I'd like to support her. Um, and then I forgot to do it in time for the blog tour, but I caught up with it and I'm glad I did because it was very much worth reading. And number nine, we have On a Distant Ridgeline by Sam Reese. So speaking of Isabel Kenyon, uh, she sent me this one as well. This was a sort of literary fiction short story collection. Um, it had a, a lot of different kind of tales in it, but they all kind of were bound together by a common theme. Uh, Charlie of Charles Heathcote here on Booktube also read it and also enjoyed it. Um, I think what was interesting about it is for me, it was like a great reminder of why presses should be pu uh, should be publishing uh, short story collections. They're kind of infamously difficult to market. Um, and it's a shame because this one just sort of showed why they can actually be really good. It was very thought provoking and very much worth a read. At number eight, we have Yuval Noah Harari with 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. So this is a non-fiction book. Harari is a gay Israeli tech guy, I guess you would call him. Um, and basically this is like a sort of a series of mini essays on different topics. I will say there was no real like cohesive narrative to it. Um, so it didn't really come across as like narrative non-fiction. It was much more just a collection of stuff he's been thinking about. But nevertheless, um, very much worth reading his thoughts on various stuff from AI to, you know, the future of war and healthcare and all of this stuff. So very thought provoking read. It could have been better than it was, but it was also still very good. At number seven, we have Shakespeare by Bill Bryson. So this is a biography of Shakespeare. Uh, it's quite a thin one, but then Bryson himself admits, like, there's a lot we don't know about Shakespeare. So he kind of covered what we can know and what we can surmise. Lots of stuff about his plays as well. If you're interested in Shakespeare, it's definitely worth a read. I mean, I'm a Shakespeare fan and a Bill Bryson fan, so that's kind of why I picked it up and probably why I enjoyed it so much as well. And number six, we have The Truth by Peter James. So Peter James is mostly known for his Roy Grace series of crime novels. This one was more of like a thriller. Um, yeah, it basically revolved around this plot where this uh, rich guy offers to buy a baby. Like he offers to basically like artificially inseminate somebody and to take their baby. And then there are these sort of very strange elements that start to creep and play, like some cult-like vibes. Very twisty and turny novel uh, early on in James's career, but uh, still, again, very much worth reading. And number five, we have Fauna by David Hartley. This is another short story collection that Isabel Kenyon sent me. So shout outs to uh, Isabel. Uh, the, the, the short story collections that she works with are fan fantastic. Like, again, as I say, this is like uh, the Sam Reese book, which um, just is a reminder of why um, short story collections are still relevant and why publishers ought to invest in them even if they're like not considered to be as marketable. This one also had like a running theme so as you can tell from the title Fauna there were like animal themes throughout it and I'm a big animal lover but also it was just beautifully written and very well constructed. And number four we have The Fall by Albert Camus so this is basically uh, in the format of like a Parisian lawyer is in Amsterdam and he's chatting to a guy in a bar about his life. Um, there's lots of like phil uh, philosophy to it. What I will say about this one is I didn't actually tab out like a huge amount to share from it. It was one of those books where I was enjoying it so much that I just sort of whizzed through it. Um, there were like, you know, little bits that I could bring up for discussion, but mostly it's kind of, I don't know, I think it's a very like introverted insular novel where you have to kind of have the dialogue with yourself as opposed to making a booktube video about it, you know? And number three, we have Corrings by Stephen Colgan. So this is the third book in his South Heraldshire series, published by Unbound, which is a very cool publisher, which does sort of like crowdfunded publishing. And um, it's uh, basically like 
it's kind of got like Douglas Adams-y humor vibe to it, but it's also crime. Um, it's kind of similar in, in tone, really, to the Lightfold books that I wrote. I would say my books are maybe a little bit darker and a little bit... Mine are kind of more cozy mystery, whereas his are more humor, but there are kind of crossovers between the two genres. In this one, basically, um, this uh, old troupe of like geriatric circus performers comes to a small English village and we uh, watch the chaos that then ensues. There's also um, this like kind of rich aristocratic uh, couple where uh, the woman's the older one and then she has a little brother and the little brother wants to get his hands on some money and she uh, doesn't want that to happen. And uh, yeah, all kinds of shenanigans ensue. She ends up going to a sex shop. Definitely recommend it. And number two, we have The Crucible by Arthur Miller. So this is a play about uh, the Salem witch trials. Uh, again, one of those that's full of great lines. There was one where somebody was moving some books and somebody was like, oh, these are heavy. And then the guy replies, it's because of the weight of knowledge that's uh, within them, which I just thought was fantastic. Um, he does also, in at least in the edition that I had, the play is like broken up by little, almost like self-reflective mini essays where he talks about the real history. Um, because he sort of points out that like, we kind of know what happened, but we don't know necessarily a huge amount about the characters. So we might know there's a guy called John Smith, but we don't know what John Smith was like. So he was able to take some kind of uh, creative interpretation of that there. But uh, so in these little mini essays, he kind of shares what he knows and what is known historically about the people. Uh, so it makes it like a really interesting like historical fiction play. I'd love to see it performed. I have watched the movie, which was just okay. Um, but yeah, The Crucible by Arthur Miller. Which brings us to my favorite book of the quarter, and this is Lost at Sea by John Ronson. So this is almost in the vein of uh, Yuval Noah Harari's book in that it's non-fiction, but it does feel very fragmented. It's like, well, it's, it's his investigative journalism basically and you've got like the different chapters are dedicated to different things but that actually has a huge advantage because it means if you're not too interested in one of the subject matters you've only got to get to the end of the chapter and then you move on to another one so like previously i've read uh, the psychopath test by john ronson which was pretty good um, but this one i enjoyed a lot more because again there was just such variety in what was covered um, there was also a lot of stuff i mean i think you'd enjoy it more if you were british because there's like references to british pop culture so it starts out with um going behind the scenes at Deal or No Deal and like at a hotel where all of the uh, competitors are all gathered together and like people are saying to him like are you are you the banker do you know the banker uh, there's all this like paranoia in the air and everyone's got their systems for beating the show um, he also did a little bit about uh, the trial that ensued after that there was a on who wants to be a millionaire there was a, a British army major retired army major who was accused of cheating through this system of coughs in the audience and uh, he kind of covers the trial there and um, you know spent some time with the people who were on trial uh, and there was like an interesting little note there as well where he said the guy who wrote um, Some Dog Millionaire he got the idea for that basically he was watching the trial on TV and he thought well if a British army major can get accused of that what hope does like a you know an Indian peasant kid have of being accused of fraud or whatever so uh, yeah, very interesting read, lots of great stuff in there. Like another one, he goes behind the scenes at a UFO convention with Robbie Williams. He goes on patrol with like, the, there's some people in America who are like real life superheroes who dress up in costumes and try and fight crime. So yeah, just lots of like really cool subject matter in there. It really was a very good read. Also, he uh, was doing competitive eating and he was talking about Matt Stoney, who I watch on YouTube, so that was cool. So there we have it, those are my Q3 favorite books. These are the top 10 of about, what, 80 or 90 that I read over the quarter. Maybe a bit less this quarter, actually, because I've been reading a lot of longer books. So probably about 65, something like that. I will be following this up with my favorites of quarter four, which will be out right at the start of next year, because obviously I have to get to the end of December for it. And then what I do is I do my overall year favorites, where I take my 10 favorites from each of the four quarters and then put them in the definitive list. Uh, so I will let you know I'll give you a little bit of a spoiler now. So my year favourites, currently out on top. Uh, <laughs> so I guess this wasn't a great read because Lost at Sea by John Ronson only comes in at number five of my top of the quarter. And uh, so we also have, and I'm not gonna reveal the order, but we also have I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou, The Queen's Gambit by Walter Tevis, Steppenwolf by Herman Hesse, and Cat on a Hot Tin Roof by Tennessee Williams. So uh, those are my top five at the moment, but we still have court four to go, and I'm hopeful we might find some new ones to go right up there. In fact, I've already read one, 
that is a strong contender. So there we have it, those are my top 10 books of quarter three of 2021. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye bye.